to the first video lecture of the second half of our course. Um, uh, you'll notice one thing about these video lectures, uh, and that is that they're somewhat shorter than uh, a regular class period. And that's because these lectures are, are only part of what would go on in our regular class. Um, we wouldn't be uh, discussing things. You wouldn't be asking me questions. You wouldn't be laughing at my jokes. And so uh, these will, will be fairly compressed. They'll feel fairly compressed. We'll make room for the discussions and the questions and so on um, in, our, in our synchronous online meetings uh, uh, that we'll have at the regular class time. But you're not going to be watching these lectures at that time. You'll be um, having these lectures help you be introduced to the material along with the book. And also, um, you'll be able to watch them again when you want to review, when you're working on homework problems or when you're studying for a test. So, so these will tend to be much shorter than, than the 80 minutes that we have for our classes. Okay, the topic for today is multi-stage rockets. Let's begin by reviewing where we've come from. Okay, let's start with a bit of a recap of the story so far, the basic relations that we've got for, um, for a rocket propulsion. And there are really three important equations. And so what are they? Well, the first equation, the first equation is the equation that tells us about thrust. And that equation tells us that the, the thrust in newtons is equal to the mass rate, the rate at which propellant is expelled from the rocket motor in kilograms per second, times the exhaust speed in meters per second. So it's very simple. The, the more fuel you expel, or the faster you expel it, the greater the thrust. The second equation is the, um, is the, uh, uh, the, the equation for, for specific impulse. That's a way we measure the, the efficiency of a rocket motor. And the specific impulse is defined to be um, the, uh, the exhaust speed in meters per second divided by g, the acceleration of gravity at the Earth's surface, 9.8 meters per second squared. We use this value of g even if we're computing the specific impulse of a rocket in, in deep space or on the moon or something. Now the specific impulse winds up to be some number of seconds. It's a little hard to interpret. We found that, um, that the best rocket motors, uh, best chemical rocket motors like the ones that are used to, to, for space launch vehicles, are, um, are, are have typically specific impulses of a few hundred seconds. Um, but it's, a, it's a simply a, a different way of expressing the exhaust speed information. They really are the same up to that factor of 9.8. And finally, um, in, our, in our last um, uh, lecture before uh, spring break, we introduced the fundamental equation, the equation that, that, uh, that some people call the rocket equation. We're calling it Tsiolkovsky's equation, because Tsiolkovsky was the one who in invented it. And it's an equation that tells you the total amount of speed change that a particular rocket can accomplish. And it, it goes like this, that that total delta V is the exhaust speed U times the natural logarithm of the ratio of the initial mass of the rocket to the final mass, the mass with the fuel and the mass without the fuel. This is a, uh, a, a and, and that's called the mass ratio. So the exhaust speed times the logarithm of the mass ratio tells you the total delta V that the um, craft can accomplish. We also introduced the SD rocket, the standard design rocket. It's a simplified example that, um, uh, that we, we use, and it has many of the same uh, kinds of characteristics of, of modern liquid-fueled space launch vehicles. So let's explain the standard rocket. Here's a little picture of a standard rocket, standard design rocket. Um, but, uh, but of course, inside it has tanks containing, containing fuel and oxidizer, and it also has a, a payload that it carries. Now, we, we're going to imagine that we can build a, a rocket of this type in any size. We can build small ones or big ones. Uh, and so if we w talk about an SD-100 rocket, that just means that the initial mass all fueled up with the payload is 100 units. Uh, and uh, um, 
And we're also going to assume that the rocket motor of the standard design rocket has an, uh, um, a, uh, a specific impulse for its engine of about 300 seconds, which is a, a pretty good specific impulse. And that, of course, means that the exhaust speed uh, from the rocket motors of a standard design rocket is g times the specific impulse, which is 2,940 meters per second. Now, um, uh, uh, the, the mass of the standard design rocket is apportioned in a particular way. That's the standard part of it. Um, the total mass budget, we might call it, uh, you take the total mass of the rocket and it's apportioned in this way. About 80% of the mass of the rocket is fuel and oxidizer. So four-fifths of the rocket's mass is that stuff in the fuel tank, stuff that will be expelled um, uh, as exhaust during the, um, during the rocket's flight. About 10% of the mass is composed of the structure, the fuel tanks, the fuel pumps, the rocket engines, and all the, all the, uh, the, the parts that are needed to make the, the rocket work. And about 10% of the mass of the rocket is in the useful payload of the rocket up there at the top of the rocket. Um, and so that means that a standard uh, design rocket uh, could accomplish a total delta V, a total change in speed of u, which is 2940 meters per second, times the log of 5. That 5 is 100% divided by 20%, because after we expend all the fuel, all you're left with is the structure and the payload. So that's 100% divided by 20%, which is 5. 2940 uh, uh, meters per second times the log of 5, which is 4730 meters per second. And notice, by the way, that delta V can be bigger than U. The speed that's achievable by the rocket can actually be faster than the exhaust speed, provided that the, um, uh, that the mass ratio is large enough. You might still be working on homework from this last material that I've just very briefly sketched a review of. And so if, you, if we want to delve a little more deeply into it and so on, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll use that in our, in our class, online class meeting. Um, uh, but having talked about Tsiolkovsky's equation and, and this business of, of what delta V can we, can we get out of it, we're going to want to now ask, how do we transcend those limits? How do we um, get past the practical limits that we have on the mass ratio and the, uh, and the um, uh, exhaust speed of an ordinary chemical rocket? How do we achieve our goal? What's our goal? Our goal is to go to space. And to get into low Earth orbit, we need a total delta V of around 9.4 kilometers per second, 9,400 meters per second. That's the goal. And a standard designed rocket of any size will be incapable of reaching that goal. So, so how do we do it? Well, we do it by using the idea of a multi-stage Okay, if we're going to go faster than the delta V that, um, that Tsiolkovsky's um, equation uh, gives us, and, the, and we're going to transcend those technological limitations, we need to do something we've talked about a couple of times before. We need to build a multi-stage rocket. And there are two kinds of multi-stage rockets. The first kind is what's sometimes called the stacked configuration, or sometimes the tandem configuration. Um, and it consists of a, a first stage, a booster stage, and then there's a second stage and maybe a third or fourth stage, but first and second for sure. And during, at launch, only the booster is firing. And then later on, the booster and its rocket engines and fuel tanks and everything is discarded once its, once its fuel tanks are empty. And the second stage, the upper stage, takes over. Um, and so uh, at that stage, you can get rid of some mass, uh, the mass of the empty first stage, in order, to, in order to improve the performance of the second stage. So that's the, uh, that's the stacked configuration. And there's also a, um, another kind of configuration, a configuration that was, um, was developed by, by Tikhonrovov, 
and, and that's um and that's the the parallel configuration and there there's a central stage or main stage sometimes called a sustainer stage and then there are booster stages that strap onto the sides of the central stage and at launch all of the stages both the main stage and the boosters are firing their rocket motors which is one reason why this might be might be advantageous and so so then when the boosters have exhausted their fuel then they're ejected and only the central stage proceeds on um, with the fuel that it has remaining um, you can combine these, of course. You could have a, a first stage that also had some strap-on boosters, and then uh, another second stage um, to, to, to carry on after the central main stage is exhausted. But the, but the point is that these are, these are two um, um, similar but slightly different configurations for multi-stage rockets. So now let's, uh, let's do a calculation that will show us that a multi-stage rocket can reach orbit even though the individual stages don't have enough delta V to do it. So here we go. We're going to have a rocket that's going to be composed of two stages. And each stage is one of our SD type rockets, the, the ones that, have, that are 80% fuel, 10% structure, and 10% payload. And the payload of the first stage is actually the second stage, a small SD rocket of its own. The total mass of both stages together is 100 units. So, uh, so let's take a look at how that, how that is proportioned. The first stage has fuel of 80 units, 80 units of fuel, and a structure, fuel tanks, rocket motor, and so on, of 10 units. Now the 10 units of payload actually are the second stage, which has 8 units of fuel, 1 unit of structure, it's a much smaller rocket, and 1 unit of useful payload. Okay, so, so uh, let's figure out how that works. The, the, in the first phase of flight, the, um, um, the initial mass is 100 units, the unit of the whole stack, fuel and structure for both stages and the payload. Then we expend the fuel of the first stage, and that's reduced to 20 units. So our mass ratio for the first phase of flight until the state, first stage is ejected is 5. And again, in the second phase of flight, we have a total ma initial mass of 10 units, the whole mass of the second stage. And then we consume all the fuel, and at the end, we have just the structure of the rocket and the payload with a, for a total of two units. So in the second phase of flight, the, um, the uh, uh, mass ratio is also 5, 10 divided by 2. So let's see, how does that work out? Well, the, the delta V accomplished by the first stage is the um, uh, the, the u times the log of 100 divided by 20, and that's 4730 meters per second, as we said. And the delta V for the second stage is the same u, because it's the same specific impulse, times 10 over 2, logarithm of 10 over 2, which is again 4730 meters per second. And the total delta V that this rocket can achieve is um, in fact, um, the sum of those two, which is 9,460 meters per second. And notice that this um, is bigger than the 9.4 kilometers per second, or 9,400 meters per second, um, required to get something into low Earth orbit. So a two-stage rocket, using our standard design um, uh, pattern, uh, does provide enough delta V to overcome gravity to get to uh, uh, well above the, the Kármán line, to, uh, to accelerate to orbital speed, and to overcome um, atmospheric drag on the way up. The total of all those contributions is 9.4 kilometers per second. So we can get to orbit if we use at least a two-stage rocket. OK, so a stacked um, configuration or tandem configuration multi-stage rocket can achieve our goal of 9400 meters per second. That is to say enough delta V to get through the atmosphere, get up above the Kármán line, and get going fast enough to be in circular orbit. Um, but there's another configuration that's also used. Sometimes one is preferable, sometimes the other, uh, and that's the, uh, and that's the, 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 the next uh, subject that we'll look into. 
Okay, so now let's consider that, that um, parallel stage configuration that was developed by Tikhonrovov. And we'll use our, our uh, standard design rocket to, again, kind of give us an idea of, of how that might work. So the main stage, the central or sustainer stage, of this is, is, a, is a rocket of the standard design type, a total mass of 100 units. And then our booster stages, well, they don't have any payload. So they're, they're going to be a type we'll call uh, SDX. And they, are, they um, have a mass of 50 units each. But instead of, instead of having 80% of that being fuel, 90% of that's going to be fuel. They've got five. Each of the, each of the boosters have five um, uh, mass units of structure. And the other 45 is all fuel. So during the first phase of flight, before, from launch until before we, uh, we, we eject the, um, the booster stages, we're going to use some of the fuel of the main stage. Let's say we use half of it. We're going to use 40 units of fuel from the main stage. And we're also going to use all the fuel from the, the, the booster stages. So there are two of them. Each of them have 45 units of fuel. And so that's a total of 90 units. So let's think about it. Um, the, the main stage has 80 units of fuel, 10 units of structure, and 10 in, units of payload. And the booster stages, of which there are two, have 45 units of fuel and 5 units of payload. All right. So um, uh, in the first phase, in the first phase, we go from a total rocket mass of 200 units to a total rocket mass of only 70 units because we burn up 40 plus 90, which is 130 units of fuel. So for the first phase, once again, 200 units is the initial mass, but then afterwards all we're left with is the, is the structure of the two booster stages, five units each, and the um, main stage with half of its fuel. So that's a, a 10 plus 10 plus 40, or a total of 70 units for the final mass. And the second, uh, and that means that the, uh, that the delta V um, accomplished in this phase of flight is uh, whatever u is, and we know what u is, it's about 1.05 times u. So the log of 200 over 70 is uh, 1.05 times, uh, times u. We're going to do this in, in multiples of, uh, of u, of the, of the exhaust speed u. Now, what about the, the, the next uh, phase? Well, we get rid of the booster stages, and we're just left with the main stage with half its fuel. So initially, the mass is 60 units. 10 units of structure, 10 units of payload, 40 units of fuel. And then we burn all the fuel, so we're just left with 20 units for the final mass. And that means that delta V for that is U times the natural log of 60 over 20. The mass ratio is 3. And that's 1.1 times U. OK, so where does that leave us? Well, the total delta V is the sum of those two, 1.05 plus 1.1 times u. That gives us 2.15 times u. And since uh, we, we know what u is for the standard, uh, the standard rocket motor, we can just multiply it out. And we find that, um, uh, that this gives us 6,320 meters per second for our total delta v, which is a lot more than a single stage can give us. In this case, it's not quite enough to reach orbit. So now we've seen, by example, the, the basic ideas of, of stacked and parallel configurations of multi-stage rockets. Um, and uh, and we, can, we can do computations and simple artificial examples um, involving um, uh, our standard design rockets and, and things that we can, we can derive from that. But what about a real example? Okay, let's, um, let's uh, sort of uh, um, uh, complete this discussion by looking at a real example of a multi-stage rocket, a, a very important rocket in the history of spaceflight. And that rocket is the Saturn 1B. Now, this is not the rocket that took the Apollo astronauts to the moon. That was the Saturn V, but its smaller cousin. This was the rocket that was designed to take the Apollo spacecraft, the command service module, into Earth orbit 
for Earth orbital missions, like um, the uh, uh, like uh, Apollo Seven, the first test of the uh, of the of the Apollo spacecraft, and later on they used this rocket for the Skylab missions, which was the first American space station. Okay, so um, uh, so here's the Saturn One B, and let me tell you all about the Saturn One B. So the first stage of the Saturn One B is um, uh, is a, a, a gigantic thing. It's got 400,000 kilograms, 400 metric tons of fuel, um, and uh, uh, and about 42,000 kilograms of structure, including rocket motors, tanks, pumps, and so on. Um, the fuel was uh, RP1, which is a uh, which is basically a, a high grade of kerosene. It's a it's a um, uh, an oil based fuel and liquid oxygen. All right. It turns out that the um, specific impulse at sea level um, uh, for the uh, first stage is 272 seconds, which is which is pretty good. It, it's pretty good. The upper stage, the the, the second stage, has about 104,000 kilograms of fuel and a structure. Uh, weighing about 10,600 kilograms, and the fuel for this stage is um, is liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. This is a much higher performing fuel. It's tricky to handle because liquid hydrogen is so cold, but um, uh, it has a specific impulse of 420 seconds, which is a very high specific impulse. This is the specific impulse in a vacuum because by the time the second stage um, uh, the second stage fires, you are above most of the atmosphere. And finally, there's the payload. The payload includes the Apollo spacecraft, um, it includes the launch escape mechanism and so on. The total mass of the payload is about 18,000 kilograms, or, or 18 metric tons. Okay, so this is a lot of information, but this information will let us answer some really interesting questions. We'll be able to answer the um, the initial and final masses and the exhaust speed for each phase of the rocket's flight. The the first stage um, uh, booster sta booster phase and then the second stage um, upper phase of the flight that takes over after that. And from these pieces of information we'll be able to find the total delta V for the vehicle and we'll be able to answer the question can it reach Earth orbit? Of course the answer will be yes but, but, but let's see it for ourselves. Okay, so let's work out the mass budget. Okay, let's see how the details work out. There on the right hand side we have the the um, the, the mass budget of the uh, of the Saturn 1B and the specific impulses of the first stage and second stage rocket motors. So let's look at the first phase of flight, the phase during which the booster stage is firing. So the the exhaust velocity, exhaust speed of the rocket motors there is just g times 272 seconds, which is 2670 meters per second. That's the exhaust speed of the first stage rocket motors. Um, and then we can work out the initial and final masses of the uh, first phase of flight. That initial mass is the sum of all five masses, the payload, the fuel, the structure, uh, um, for both stages. Now the final mass is all of that mass minus the fuel that's consumed, which is the 400,000 kilograms uh, of fuel in the first stage. So we go from 574,000 kilograms to 174,000 kilograms. That's a, a mass ratio of, of better than three. And the delta V produced by this first phase of flight is uh, 2670 meters per second times the logarithm of 574,000 over 174,000, and that turns out to be 3,180 meters per second. That's the delta V achieved in the first phase of flight, the phase while the first stage is burning. Now we discard the empty first stage, and we only have to consider the second stage and the payload. So in the second phase of flight, the, um, the exhaust speed is the exhaust speed of that second um, uh, stage motor, which is much higher. Uh, it's a 420 second um, uh, 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 ISP, 
and so that gives it an exhaust speed of 4,120 meters per second. That liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen fuel mixture has a very high um, uh, specific impulse. Now let's consider the masses. The initial mass is the fuel and structure of the second stage plus the payload. So that adds up to 132,600 kilograms. Now of that, during this um, phase of the flight, we burn away the fuel, which is 104,000 kilograms. And so the final mass is only the sum of the structure of the second stage and the Apollo spacecraft payload. And that's 28,600 kilograms. This mass ratio is, is bigger than four. And so what do we end up with? Well, the delta V produced by the, the second phase of flight, produced by the second stage motor, is um, is 4120 meters per second times the log of the initial mass over the final mass, and that gives me 6320 meters per second, which is pretty good. That second stage rocket is a pretty good rocket. So what's the total for the whole stack? The total for the Saturn 1B system? Well, it's delta V1 plus delta V2, 3180 plus 6320, which is 9500 meters per second. And that's bigger than 9400. This is this is comfortably able to to get the uh, to, to get the, the, the spacecraft, the Apollo spacecraft, into Earth orbit to overcome the effects of, of, of gravity, to overcome the air resistance, and to achieve orbital speed. So as you can see the real example is uh, is complicated. Um, the, the rockets are not all the same. The fuel, the, the fuel mixture matters. It matters whether you're at sea level or, or in a vacuum. But, but the math works out. And we can, we can actually see for ourselves that the basic characteristics of the Saturn 1B in this example um, allow it to, to perform its mission of launching a pretty big spacecraft into Earth orbit. And we'll see many other uh, real life examples both in our, in our uh, homework exercises that I'll, that I'll um, deliver at the end of this week, and also, the, um, uh, also many other examples that we, we consider in the course of our class. All right, here's what we're going to be doing for the next couple of weeks. Uh, next uh, lecture on Thursday, we're going to be talking about um, energy and escape. We're going to be talking about, um, uh, we're going to be uh, talking about gravitational potential energy in particular, and we're going to be talking about the um, the idea of escape speed. If you go fast enough, then gravity uh, will will not you'll be able to completely overcome gravity, and what goes up just doesn't come down at all. Then next week we'll have a couple of historical lectures. On Tuesday we'll talk about the space race, the um, the the superpower competition during the 1960s and early 70s um, uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, in the realm of space achievement. On Thursday, um, we'll talk about the use of, of rockets uh, to, uh, to do planetary exploration, um, to send robot probes to distant parts of our solar system, and to really revolutionize our knowledge about the corner of the universe we live in. Then, the following week, two weeks from today, um, uh, we'll have uh, our first midterm test. And that will cover things like drag force and terminal speed from before the break, rocket propulsion, the three basic equations, including multi-stage rockets that we talked about today, uh, energy and escape speed, and these historical topics uh, related to the material that we cover next week. So that's the plan for the next two weeks. Okay, that's it. Good luck. Um, uh, uh, I'll see you um, uh, in our uh, online meeting uh, at the usual class time, that's 2.40 to 4 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, whatever time that is in your time zone. Um, and, uh, and for at least the first part of that class, we'll get together and talk about this kind of example and other things. We'll answer questions, we'll work, we'll, uh, um, work on new things together, and, uh, and we'll, we'll help ourselves learn uh, rocket science a little bit more perfectly. Mm -hmm.